the friction needed to set an object in motion and the friction resisting an object that is in motion. That's the main difference between our two coefficients of friction. I think the easiest way to take a look at these and understand them is with examples. So we'll look at two quick examples right now. In our first example, we have a block that is at rest on a, uh, on a flat surface, and there is a, an unapplied force of 200 newtons that is being applied to the right. We are given that the static coefficient of friction is 0 0.32, and you'll notice if we go back, uh, I'm sorry, I did not define these. We take a look, the static coefficient of friction, it's actually just a ratio, I should have said this previously. Mu, or the coefficient of friction, it's just the ratio of the force of friction to the normal force. And it's actually, actually the same equation for the kinetic coefficient of friction. It's the ratio of the frictional force. I apologize, that might be hard to see. The frictional force to the normal force. The difference is, for the static coefficient of friction, it's the static frictional force. And for the kinetic coefficient of friction, it's the kinetic force. So the amount of friction statically that you must overcome to move the object and the amount of friction kinetically that resists the object that is currently in motion. So we know that the static coefficient of friction, which is the ratio of the frictional force to the normal force, is 0 0.32. And we know that the kinetic coefficient of friction is 0 0.21. What they're asking us to find is that actual static force of friction and the actual kinetic force of friction. The actual force that resists any change in that object's motion from rest and the actual force that resists the object's motion once it is moving. Lastly, they want to know what is the acceleration of this object based on everything that's occurring here. Uh, I believe I left out, I did, so I will add in here that this block actually has a mass of 50 kilograms. So we have a 50 kilogram mass and this force is acting on it. So the first thing we should always do in any one of these problems is draw a free body diagram. So we draw a free body diagram. We know that the center of mass is where all of these forces act. We know that this object must have some kind of weight. We know that it's at rest on a flat table. Therefore, there must be some kind of normal force. We know that this object has an applied force of 200 newtons to the right. And since we're given there's a static and kinetic coefficient of friction, we cannot ignore friction. And we know that it will oppose the motion of this object. So we have some kind of force of friction acting left, an applied force acting right, a normal force acting up, and the force of weight acting down. Now we should be able to do some basic calculations. We know that the force of weight is going to be equal to the mass of the object times the acceleration due to gravity, which in this case is 50 times negative 9.81, which will give us negative 490. 0.5 newtons. So that is the weight of the object acting down. We should be able to realize that since the acceleration in the y direction is zero, that means that our net force in the y direction must also be zero. And in order for our net force in the y to be zero, our weight and our normal force must be equal and opposite. So the normal force must be 490.5 newtons. Now we don't know what the frictional force is here. But if we want to look at the static friction force, or the friction that resists any change in this object's motion, uh, basically the force that must be overcome in order to set this object into motion, we will use our static coefficient of friction. Now we know that the static coefficient of friction, if we go back, is equal to the static frictional force divided by the normal force. That should help us figure out what we're looking for right here. So we know in this case that our Static coefficient of friction is 0 0.32. We know that's equal to the force of friction, static, over the normal force, which in this case is 490.5 newtons. With some basic algebra, we should be able to figure out that the static frictional force will be 490 times 0.32, which should give us 156.96 newtons. That is the static frictional force that must be applied in order to set this object in motion. Uh, that's a little bit hard to see. I will rewrite, rewrite it down here, 156.96 newtons.
So if I apply 150 newtons to this box, this will not move. If I do not apply, if I don't apply 156.96 newtons, this block will remain exactly in place. Now that we know this, we realize since 200 newtons is applied, it's greater than 156.96. Therefore, it's greater than the required force to move this block, and this block will move as a result. It will actually accelerate. So now the question becomes, since we know it's in motion and we know it's accelerating because we've exceeded the amount of force required to set it into motion, to change it from rest, or to change it from its static state, we now have to figure out what is that kinetic friction force? What is that frictional force that resists the object's motion now that we've proven that it's actually moving? Well, hopefully you're seeing now that we do the same setup. However, we use the kinetic coefficient of friction which in this case is 0 0.21, and it's equal to the kinetic friction force divided by the normal force. So if we just use our other coefficient, which is 0 0.21, we set it equal to our kinetic frictional force divided by our normal force, we should be able to find that the force of friction, once this object is actually moving, is 103 newtons. So while it requires 157, roughly, newtons to set this object in motion, once it's moving, we only have to apply 103 newtons or more in order to keep it moving. So if we take a look, we now have the amount of force required to set it in motion, the amount of force required to keep it in motion, and lastly, we want to know this acceleration. Well, there's a few things we can look at here. We now know that our force of friction once it's moving is 103 newtons, so we can set that to 103 newtons. We know already that the net force in the y direction is zero, therefore our acceleration in the y is zero. We also know that in the x we have 200 newtons to the right, 103 newtons to the left, so if we'd like to calculate our net force in the x direction, that will wind up giving us 200 newtons minus 103 newtons, which should give us 97 newtons the right. If we use Newton's second law, we should realize that the net force in the x direction equals the mass times the acceleration in the x direction. It's just F equals ma applied only in the x direction. We know that the net force in the x direction is 97. We know that the mass is 50 kilograms and we're looking for the acceleration. Now in this case, we should be able to look at this diagram and realize Based on this setup, it will only accelerate in the x. There's no way that this will accelerate up and down. There's no up and down force. So if we solve this, we should be able to find that the acceleration in the x direction is 1.94 meters per second squared. Uh, I found that by simply dividing 97 by 50. So the keys to take away from this example if we're given the static coefficient of friction, we should be able to find the static frictional force, which is actually the amount of force that must be applied in order to overcome this object's inertia and set it into motion. Once it's moving, the kinetic coefficient of friction can be used to help us find the actual frictional force that resists that motion. And just be aware that no matter what type of problem, frictional, gravitational, uh, no matter what problem we're looking at, Newton's second law, F equals ma, will always apply. Sometimes it will be in the x direction, as it is in this case. Sometimes it will be in the y direction. But at the end of the day, if you know the net force in any direction, and you know the object's mass, you will always be able to calculate the object's acceleration in that direction.